we'll be standing around. Uh, yeah, coat chip shirts. And we also have some swag up at the front as well. So again, thanks for having us. All right. <laughs>
Hooray, that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you that don't know what container days is, it's basically. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, just quickly <laughs> um, microservices, the containerization of, of life, which is happening. So, anyone really interested, uh, you know, in the Docker, Kubernetes, things of that nature, um, you know, touch base with Anastas, um, and, you know, we're looking for anyone who wants to step up and help in uh, organizing and bringing it to Blossom because it's been a wonderful conference. It's been here for the past two years. Um, we don't want to see it slip by, uh, you know, in 2017. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so uh, two more things. I promise we're almost there. Thanks for hanging in. Uh, the other thing is that in August on the 31st, uh, we're going to be having our summer social, so also Boston DevOps summer social. It's going to be at Milk Street at the Boston CIC, so it's going to be awesome. It's going to be super fun. Awesome. I hope to see you all there. I will be there. It will be great. <laughs> and then the last thing, uh, as Dave loves to talk about and as I also really appreciate that he talks about so much, the community is made up of all of us, right? Like. That's what makes this community so special and so fantastic, is the participation of each of you. Um, and we realized that as a group, like as a meetup, we've gotten really, really big. And so what does that mean? Um, it just means that as we grow, we wanna make sure that everybody who is in this community feels safe, feels included, feels like they can be themselves in the community. And so something that we've done and that we're working on to try to make that a reality is a code of conduct. Um, right now it's in a draft stage, and so we're looking for folks who either have experience previously, like editing or creating codes of conduct, folks who are interested in this sort of thing, just come up, chat with me and Dave. We really want to get this out to people in the community to get your eyes on it so that you can look at it and be like, hey, you forgot this, hey, this looks great, just so that we're not doing it in the dark. So again, Dave, me, make it happen. You all are great. That's why we want this, to keep this community being awesome. You tell us. Okay, and we're only running nine minutes late, so that's fantastic. Um, so without further ado, I want to bring up our first speaker, Jim Veriquist from Hierocracy. Uh, Jim's going to be talking to us about side projects at work. I'm just going to let you take it away. You ready? Yes. All right. Give it up for Jim. I need to switch computers real quick. Oh, do you need, do you need some computers? Thank you. On my laptop? It did last word. Someone for the AB test, right? <laughs> 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 you back. Turn the computer off? No, 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 you're doing Okay, so I don't have full screen. I'm not sure what's wrong with that. You can have a full screen and put it back in. Bam. There we go. Okay, excellent. Looks like we're in business. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for having me. Uh, tonight I want to talk about side projects and why everyone should launch a side project of work. And one of the other things I want to talk about tonight is that if you have ambitions to launch a startup, maybe you're an employee and you want to launch a startup, it's like, why would I take my breakthrough idea and, and just basically give that away? And I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to say that uh, 
in, in a nutshell, everyone, including the people that want to launch startups, the best way to do it is to do it at work, and I'm going to kind of cover that. Uh, so side projects are important because they allow everyone to uh, an opportunity to be innovative uh, at work, and it's something that you don't have to have the right boss or you know the the right timing in terms of the project coming down. Uh, you get a you get to be innovative no matter what company you're in, no matter what position you have, and no matter what type of boss you have. So, uh, and there's no better way to supercharge your career than launching side projects. And the last thing is that if you're a manager, there's a lot of misunderstanding about side projects. You know, a lot of times people think that the people working on side projects are the slackers, and it turns out that they're actually usually the, the, the highest performing employees in the entire company. <coughs> they're doing the things that managers want all the employees to do, like when you see a problem, you just tackle it, uh, you, make your, you, you, you make your work as efficient as possible, you automate things that, um, that can be automated, that kind of stuff. And most managers kind of misunderstand what side projects are all about, so we're gonna address that as well. So without further ado, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just talk about side projects uh, more generally and, and, and how they make us feel. So <coughs> my first side project uh, was when I was in high school and I decided that I wanted to create an adventure game. Now, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the 80s, so, uh, and my first experience with computers was this game, Colossal Cave, and it just blew me away. It's what made me fall in love with, with computers. You know, these are the days where there were no graphics, uh, but you got uh, dropped into this rich text-based environment of an adventure game, and you solved puzzles, and it was just, it was fascinating. So I decided that I wanted to, to launch my own side project. Uh, I, I decided that I wanted to create my own adventure game, right? And so, uh, but here's the thing is, I had, uh, I, had, I had never created an adventure game before in my life, right? I had, no, I had never designed anything in my life. I had zero programming experience. All I had was this uh, kind of hazy dream of, of creating a, an adventure game. And so uh, I had a hand-me-down PC from my dad. Uh, he managed to get me the source code for this adventure game set in uh, on a spaceship. and. And I, uh, so I took the source code, and when you, you know, like, when you launch these side projects, it's, it's, um, you don't know what you're doing. Like, you really don't know anything about what you're doing. And these are the days before, there was no YouTube, I didn't even have a manual about how to learn basic or anything. So, what you do though, is you just start kind of trying to figure out what, what's going on. So I, I took a look at the source code, and I started understanding, okay, this is how the rooms are kind of set up, and these are all spaceship rooms, and, I don't know what kind of adventure game I'm gonna create, but now I kind of get that. Advent these adventure games are all about creating puzzles, and so you gather these objects, and you interact with people and objects, and, and solve these puzzles, and it's so, okay, now I kind of get that. So I familiarized myself a little bit with that. Now I understood more about what I was doing, right? Uh, I decided that I wanted to create an adventure game set on an island. Uh, I had the source code for an adventure game set on a spaceship, but, but who cares? I was able to create the rooms. And so I remember one day I was sitting and just uh, creating the map. For, for my for my island and, and setting up the puzzles. And, and one of the puzzles was that there was a wall and to get over the wall you needed to find the ladder. The ladder was in the closet somewhere and you had to find the closet and the, and the closet was locked, you had to get the key. So that's how these adventure games worked. And being able to design and create this entire world was just a, an amazing experience. And so, uh, you know, when I look back on my, on my childhood, and I think about the things that I, that I did that really made me feel good. I did some things from schoolwork. You know, I, I drew some pictures and I, that I'm proud of. I, I did some, um, you know, I created a, a school newspaper one time, and, but those were all things that were kind of assigned to me, right? The thing that I'm most proud of from my childhood is this adventure game, because it was something that I created, like I, it was something that I, I, I did on my own. Uh, nobody asked me to do it. I just had this, this, uh, this uh, desire to create an adventure game and I had no idea what I was getting into and I just did it and it was great. And what's also funny about side projects is that they create opportunities for you that you, you can't even anticipate when it happens, right? 
because I did this, I fell in love with computers and programming. So then I got a software engineering degree. Of course I got a software engineering degree, right? Uh, and when it's funny because after I went to uh, college and I went to get my first job, part of the interview, I was talking about this adventure game I created when I was a teenager. Like, this is years before, right? And there, yeah, okay, you did all this cool school work. You were in school for four years doing your, your computer science degree. But tell us about this, th this project that you did where you created your own adventure game. And, and so these, these side projects let you not only do things that you want to do, um, but they also, th they're, they're something that most people don't do. Most people don't go out and create something new unless they're asked to do that. And when you do that, you really kind of set yourself apart. So it was an amazing experience. And my working definition for a really cool side project is you need two things. First, you need something that you want to do. It can be anything. It doesn't matter if you've never done it before. In fact, if you've never done it before, that's even better, right? Uh, and the second thing is you have no idea what you're going to do or how you're going to do it. That's, the, that's a good side project. If you know exactly what, you, what you're going to do and you've done it 10 times before, you can get a job doing it, you can get paid to do it, you can get permission to do it, you can do all these things, right? Um, but a, a real side project is something that you want to do and you have no idea what you're going to do, but you just go do it. And what's really cool about side projects is that you can do this at work. And I think this is what most people don't understand and that's what we're going to cover tonight. And I hit the wrong way. <coughs> we're back at the beginning, okay. So the first thing you have to understand about side projects, which I've kind of alluded to, is that every side project, every project that you launch in this way is an adventure into the unknown. Like you literally have no idea what you're doing, you have no idea where it's gonna go, you have no idea what you're getting into, but you do it anyway because it's cool. And um, we all like to tackle challenges, we all like to do really cool things. And if we, if we know where we're going, usually it, it takes a lot, of, a, a lot of that out there. So, um, so it's the adventure into the unknown that is kind of the basis of the side project. Every single side project that, that matters, that we're proud of, uh, they're an adventure into the unknown. So my first side project at work uh, was when I was in the Marine Corps. And I was stationed in Japan. I was about three years into a four-year uh, tour of duty. And when most of us think about the Marine Corps, do we think a, a, a bastion of innovation and opportunity? <laughs> Not really, right? I mean, uh, the Marine Corps is about this top-down, hierarchical, do what you're told, only do what you're told organization in the entire world. And even better is I was in the legal department and I was the lowest ranking person in the entire legal department. Like there was nobody below me in, in, in my department. And so uh, those are not usually the recipe for uh, being able to, to be innovative. And, uh, but what happened is uh, I had just transferred into the legal services office. This was a small office uh, in the larger legal services department. And there was really three people. There was an enlisted person who handled the marriages, so if a Marine wanted to get married, uh, they needed to come to us and we helped them gather all the paperwork. Marriage is complicated in Japan, you're dealing with different nationalities, all this kind of stuff. So we did that. There was a Japanese national who handled most of the immigration stuff and then there was a lawyer who handled the lawyer stuff. And the very first week I walked into the office, uh, a couple walked in, a Marine and, and his fiance, and they had just come back from Tokyo. This is Iwakuni. They had just come back from Tokyo and they said, we went all the way to Tokyo to get married, and they turned us away because we didn't have the right paperwork. And, uh, and, and for me, I was just, uh, I mean, I, I, I was embarrassed and I felt helpless because I didn't help this, these people. Uh, the, the person who did had already transferred back to the States or getting out of the Marine Corps. I had no idea what happened. I had no, no idea where the breakdown was. I had no idea what the problem was. I had no idea if there was a solution. But right at that moment, I said, this is crazy and I am never going to have another person walk in the office and tell me that they went all the way to Tokyo to get married and came back and weren't married. And you have to understand that these are enlisted people. I don't know what it's like now, but when I was in the Marine Corps as an enlisted person, like you barely could survive. Like you did not make, 
you know, we're not millionaires uh, as an illicit person in the Marine Corps. Traveling to Tokyo from Iwakuni was incredibly expensive. His fiance was uh, Filipino, so she was on a visa. There were visa issues. They had to go back to, to the Philippines to get all, I mean, this is, it's not like, you know, just, oh, you know, I, I couldn't do it this weekend, I'll do it next weekend. This was a big deal. And when I looked into it a little bit, I found out that this had been going on for 30 years. Like, most of the time, you know, the process worked fine, but every once in a while there's these edge cakes that nobody quite uh, had a handle on. And, and so <laughs> they would come back and they weren't able to get married. And I decided right at that moment, I had, I had no idea what I was committing myself to, but I decided I'm not gonna let that happen again. And once again, in true kind of adventure into the unknown, uh, you know, style, I, I uh, didn't know uh, what the problem was. I didn't know if there was a solution. Um, I had no domain expertise. I mean, like literally my training for marriages was here's the marriage packet, you hand it out, you walk through the checklist, and, and that's, that was my training. And uh, so and one of the things is that I also definitely was not gonna tell my boss about the problem. Like I'm not gonna tell my superior officer that look, there's this problem, and this couple came in, they didn't get married. Uh, well, wait, wait, who's in charge? Oh yeah, that's me. And what's my, like, I have no idea what the problem is, and what's the solution? I have no idea what the solution is. Like, you don't do that. You don't do that in, in your companies. You don't do that in the Marine Corps especially, right? Like, I would, I would most likely get in trouble. Even if it was a process problem, uh, I was the person there, and so it would, it, it would fall on me. So, I just uh, decided that I was going to launch a project and solve this problem. And what's, uh, you know, what's, what's funny about it is that uh, if somebody was gonna, if somebody knew about this problem and pick somebody, wanted to pick somebody to solve this problem, like I would probably be the last person that they would pick to do this, right? I couldn't stand the Marine Corps, I couldn't wait to get out, right? I was the lowest ranking person, I knew nothing about the problem or anything, like nobody would pick me. But I wanted to solve this problem, that's actually all, all that matters. And so when you, when you work on these side projects, they all start with a desire to change the world. And what's at, you know, so I just started doing what, what is obvious. Um, you, you call the embassy and you start talking to, to, to them and finding out what's going on. And eventually I figured out what the problem was, marriages are complicated, different nationalities, you know, like in, the, in, her, in their case, she was a Philippine national who hadn't been married before, there was kids and there was, there was stuff that just wasn't on the, on the checklist. And so it was all about, you know, creating uh, a better process around that. I did that and at the end, what happened actually surprised me. Uh, I ended up getting a meritorious promotion I got a Navy Achievement Medal, which most people, one, you know, if you're in the Marine Corps for one tour, you don't normally get a Navy Achievement Medal um, as an enlisted person. I got that. But what's, what's really neat is that I didn't do this project for any of that. Like, that was the furthest thing from my mind. The only thing that was on my mind was that this is, this is something I wanted to solve, and so I went out and did it. And um, so that's kind of, that, that's, uh, that's how that side project worked. One of the things I did in the Marine Corps intuitively, but I found out that is true for every site project, if you want to do something, you never ask permission. I mean, never. It doesn't matter what company you're in, it doesn't matter who your boss is. You never ask permission because you don't know what you're doing. It's an adventure into the unknown, right? Um, a lot of times you don't even have the language to explain like what you're trying to do. Like, I, I'm trying to do something. Like, that's not usually fundable, right? You're not usually gonna get permission. Um, there's all these reasons that um, most of the time you're not gonna get permission. And if you ask for permission and then you do it anyway, you're more likely to get in trouble than if you never ask permission, you just go do it, right? Uh, so that's, that's one of the first keys. Now, of course, if you're never gonna ask permission, you've gotta, you've gotta play by the rules. Like, you don't never ask permission and then, you know, it's like, well, I think an ERP system would be really good in this company, so you steal the boss's credit card, and <laughs> you don't do that, right? Like, uh, the ground rules are, number one, you never create risk for the company or for yourself, and number two, you never let it interfere with your assigned duties. If you honor those two principles, you can do anything. You can tackle any problem, you can challenge any executive decision, and I'm gonna, talk about some of that stuff. Like you can literally do anything. If you're in engineering, you can solve a marketing problem. If you're in marketing, you can solve a design problem. 
your designer, you can tell the engineer, it doesn't matter what you want to do. As long as you can make some reasonable justification that this could be good for the company, you just do it. Uh, now, if you're gonna, here, here's, what's, here's what's funny, is that when it comes to never asking permission, it's like, okay, how do you do it? You did it the same way that I did it intuitively, which is you take these one tiny step, one tiny experiment at a time, right? And what's funny is that every single one of us knew how to do this in kindergarten. Like, there was, when, when we were in kindergarten, there was nothing that a little kindergartner cells wanted to do that we didn't just go out and start doing it, right? And we, sure, we fell down and failed 80% of the time, but we didn't care. We just moved ahead. Uh, by the time we're in sixth grade, like, nobody does this anymore. And so, you don't need innovation training. There is no special process. Like, as long as you could uh, do what you did in kindergarten, that's all you need to succeed uh, with side projects at work, no matter what it is you want to do. The, the second thing is, okay, never let it interfere with your assigned duties, you know, how do you have time? Well, the idea is that you always do a side project in the white space of your job. And everybody has white space uh, at work, okay? Maybe not every day, maybe not even every week, but if you really want to free up some time for a side project, we can all do that. And, um, and what's important to understand is that it's, uh, this isn't free time. Like this isn't time you're sitting around throwing the frisbee and twiddling your thumbs, right? You're doing something. Uh, it could be you are you know, um, not working at 100% of what you are theoretically possible. You could be, um, you know, you're doing something and it can take some work to free it up, but you can always free up about at least 15 to 20% of your time to work on a side project if you want to. Now, when, it, when you talk to managers, what's funny is that you, uh, if I talk to a manager and say, look, if you wanted to launch a side, you yourself wanted to launch a side project to, to tackle something, to do something, could you free up some time for, some, of course, yeah, I, I could definitely do that. But then you ask that same manager, okay, now how about your team? Like, do you think your team could free up some time for a side project? You know, is there some white space in there? Every time, it's like, absolutely not. Like, my team is operating under 20%, right? Um, you know, we are on the sprint. We've got, th there is absolutely no white space anywhere. And, 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 and basically, that's not true. Um, the idea is that you cannot manage white space. You cannot free up somebody else's white space. But we know where white space is. And it's not because we're, we're, we're slackers and we're bad people. It's actually, it's a fundamental rule of nature that um, you can't go above about 80% capacity utilization for any productive resource. This is the basis of land rotation and farming. This is the basis of the maintenance routines of equipment. And for some reason, when we come to people, we, we, we talk ourselves into believing that um, they don't need no, any white space, there, there doesn't need to be any white space, but there always is. It's, it's kind of like the same thing that happens with these budget negotiations. One of the reasons there's white space is because we don't know exactly what, what's going to happen next week or tomorrow. And so you've got to build in, we build in a little slack. If, if you push too hard one way, you're, you're, going to get, you're going to get pushback. If you push too hard, your best people are just going to leave, right? Nobody can operate at 100% full bore, all out capacity all the time. Especially when it's a, a job you're being paid to do, when it's an assigned duty, when it's somebody else's project that you're being paid to do. Like, this is nutrient depleting work. We're not gonna, we're not just gonna go game busters all day long doing that. But if you have an opportunity to work on a, on a side product, something that you are fueled by, you're, you're passionate about, that's nutrient enhancing work, right? So uh, when, when employees free up time for a side product, it just means that they're doing the things that you wish all your employees did, right? They're, they're, uh, they're automating uh, the, the boring, repetitive stuff out of their job instead of just doing it um, the, the, the hard way. And when you think about it, it's like a lot of times managers ask employees to, you know, how can you, how can you be more efficient? How can, like, what's the upside for employees? And you're basically saying like, so I'm gonna be even more efficient so then you can pile more work onto my plate? Like, no thank you. Right? Um, we don't do that. Uh, but if we have an opportunity to work on something that we want to do, it's our own thing, uh, we can always do it. So that's where you free up time. You don't do what Google did and screw it up by dedicating time and then trying to start managing it. Like, that, that's why Google killed innovation 
um, that, that used to happen the way that I'm talking about it here. Uh, and they tried to manage it. They, they offered dedicated time, which has all kinds of dysfunctions associated with it. Uh, you don't do that. You let employees figure it out and you will have innovation. Okay. So one of the really cool things about this uh, DevOps community in Boston DevOps is that we've got a lot of cool people doing really cool projects. And I haven't been associated with uh, this community for, for long, but it's an amazing community. And I've already bumped into several people who have launched side project at work. So I wanted to have uh, Jirawat from uh, Health Edge come up and talk about his side project. Jirawat. So uh, my name is Ed Jirawat from uh, Health Edge. And uh, Health Edge is a uh, health insurance software company uh, based out in Burlington, Mass. And our biggest customer is Edna. So uh, here's my testimony for a side project. Uh, so our installation uh, used to be a manual process, 40 page document, and people would literally cut and paste from a Word doc to a Unix prompt, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty bad. And uh, so I had to maintain our dev servers, and there's no way I was gonna do that on one server, much less 15. So I started uh, automating the installation on my own using uh, Ansible, and uh, about nine months ago, we had a really bad production uh, install. It was supposed to take two hours, took 14, and you could just hear the customers just angry and hurt and venomous over the phone. So uh, we took, uh, so the company made a decision to take my side project, and now it's the official uh, installation for Health Edge software. So pretty much it, you know. Uh, <laughs> sure, you don't give yourself a yeah. Jim was saying definitely resonated with my own personal experience. Uh, so yeah, if you want more details, come grab me after the meetup. You're what's on Slack as well on the Boston DevOps. So. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> okay, so the once again the ground uh, kind of the what makes a good side project is that it's something you want to do and you have no idea how you do it. As long as you've got those things, you've got a great basis for a side project. What's even better though, is when you tackle a project, a problem that you have no business solving. Like, it's not your job, you have no, no, you have not, no business trying to tackle that problem. That's a good side project, right? <laughs> um, you would never be picked to solve that problem. Though I love those kind of side projects. And even better is when every single person you talk to hates your idea. Like, that's when you really know that you're on to something. And, and, and why is that? So there's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental relationship that the probability of a breakthrough is, uh, inverse, is inversely proportional to the number of people, or directly proportional to the number of people who hate it, right? The more pe people who hate your project, the more probability that it's, it, it's, it's, on some, it, it's gonna be a breakthrough. And the reason for that is because first of all, we don't want side projects. Like, we don't have a lot of time for side projects, right? This is our own time. This is our own personal. White space is our time. It's our own personal time. We can use it to screw around. We can use it to look busy. We can use it to do something three times and we could have done it once, right? If we free it up for a side project, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We're, we're gonna focus on something that we really believe in, right? Uh, and secondly, <coughs> companies, industries, the, the status quo, it, it, you're stuck in a paradigm, right? It limits what people can see. Uh, breakthroughs happen outside the existing paradigm. If you're working on a breakthrough, by definition, it's outside of what people are currently thinking about and doing. They're literally blind to most of those opportunities. And so that's why when everybody hates your idea, that should get, fill you with energy. If everybody loves your idea, yeah, move on to something else probably. Right? Okay. So I have uh, another project I did at work was at a company called G4 Systems. And I was in, on the engineering team and one of the most powerful executives in the company was in charge of designing the interface uh, for uh, the, the software product. And the problem was is I think he was, I thought he was totally screwing it up. And you know, these are the, the days before software was designed and kind of this lean startup kind of you know, uh, cus uh, uh, 
um, customer-centered design techniques, you know, paper prototypes and rapid prototype and all that kind of stuff. You design a product on paper, you spent 12 to 18 months designing, uh, developing the product, and then you shipped it to your beta customers, and that's when you started testing it. And early on, I just felt like something is not right with this design. Once again, I had no idea what the problem was. I had no idea what the solution was. Uh, I had no power to influence. I, I tried to talk, you know, I tried to tell people, like, we've got a problem here. And nobody saw it, nobody cared, nobody listened, you know, just go do your engineering work and shut up, basically. Um, and that should have been the end of the story, but the cool thing about side projects is it's never the end of the story. Like, I was powerless to change minds, I was powerless to uh, get people to do things differently, but when it, but nobody, uh, but I had the power to launch a side project and start figuring out what was going on here, and so that's exactly what I did. And, you know, when Jirawat explained his his project, it, it, it's, it's exactly what, what happened here, is that when you launch a side project at work, any type of side project, you start with a lot of uncertainty. Like, you have no idea what you're doing. Um, the probability of success is low. The probability of failure is high. You know, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really scary thing. And so you just start trying to figure out what's going on. I just, it's like, what, what is going on? I started researching it. And then you start learning, oh, and then I bumped into this customer discovery stuff. And so then I started working on that. And along the way, you start to gain some confidence. Like, and so now you're a little less guarded about other people finding out that you're actually working on a side project because you're kind of onto something. Um, and somewhere along the way, what normally happens is somebody actually comes and finds you and wants to support your project. Could be another, another employee. It's like, wow, I heard you're working on this cool project. I'd love to join you cool, I could use all the help you know, uh, I can get. In my case, it was the marketing manager who came and found me and she said, I heard you're working on this, uh, 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 an alternative design for a product. And she said, I, I also have a lot of concerns about this design. I, I think we're on the wrong track. And so I ended up moving out of engineering over into uh, the marketing department. I uh, hired two other designers. I built my own design team. But one of the really cool things about side projects is if you, when you lead a side project, you are the person who leads that project. Like, it's your project. Nobody can ever take that away from you. If I could have early on talked the uh, marketing manager into the idea that we've got a problem and maybe if we do some customer-centered design, if I even knew what that was at that point, and talked her into the idea, and then I applied for that job that I just pitched her on, like, she would have never hired me. I had no design experience. Uh, I had I had no reason solving that problem. I had no. She would have hired somebody else, and I would have, it would have been my idea. But it ultimately, would have been somebody else's project. When I had taken this thing from nothing and started to get traction, get success, of course she's going to pick me to lead the. Like, who else would she do? That's the lowest risk uh, person to lead the project is is me. So I ended up leading that project, and that's one of the really cool things about side projects that uh, you can't get otherwise, and. At, at the end of the day, uh, when we finally got the beta testing, the customers hated the product uh, design. We had a uh, we had our alternative design right there. We're able to slide it right in, so there's no big crisis, right? The executive actually wins uh, because we didn't have to arm wrestle or argue or do some kind of power play about which design is better. It's the like the survival of the fittest, right? Um, one lost and one won, but everybody won because we had another design, and that's the kind of stuff. I don't think there's any other way to accomplish that in an established organization than with side project and giving people a, a, a way to kind of um, have space to, to do these things. So, the, all of these side projects are what's called a, um, they, they follow the dynamics of the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is you start in your ordinary world and you, you get a call to action, you run into a problem, you find some opportunity, whatever it is, and you decide to take action, right? And now you're into this unknown world, there's struggle and sacrifice, and eventually you figure things out and you have your moment of glory, and then you, know, you change, like you are different. Uh, if I wanted to, after, after G-Force, if I wanted to apply for a design job, I, I was a designer, right? Um, I could, I could get that job now. I couldn't have done that before. And I also ch and you also changed the world. So that's the hero's journey. It looks very easy, right? It's like, uh, uh, the reality is though, that there's something called the refusal to call. And this is what stops pretty much every single person who bumps into an opportunity to do something 
and, and they can't move forward. They get stuck in this thing called refusal to call. And so, uh, what is that? You know, this is uh, from the movies. It's Luke Skywalker. Uh, you know, Obi Wan Kenobi uh, tells him, "Hey, you've got an opportunity to. You know, we'd love you to come save the universe." He's like, "Well, you know, uh, my uncle. He's got this farm, and you know, like he hated. He hates that farm. He hates working there. He's been wanting to escape for years, and he's making excuses. And that's a refusal to call, right? It's not. It's because he's scared. It's Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, like." If you want to learn about innovation, real innovation, and what innovation, the dynamics of, of, of how it really works, there's, you, you would do better by watching The Wizard of Oz yeah. than by reading 95% of the innovation books out there. Because they're all written from the perspective of some big innovator, some, some person who has power and permission to be innovative, right? When you're a person who is stuck somewhere with no power, no permission, no anything, the lowest person on the totem pole, and you've got some big idea, the dynamics are very, very different. And it's all embedded in the hero's journey. So Dorothy, you know, the, the, the nasty neighbor comes to take her dog away. She pleads with her aunt, she pleads with her uncle, please save the dog, but she's not ready to actually stand up and take action herself. Um, eventually the, the dog escapes, runs back to Dorothy, and that's the moment where she's, you know what, I'm gonna do this myself. I can't rely on anybody else, and that launches her journey. And what's cool about The Wizard of Oz is that it shows you just how unknown the world is. Like, nobody could have imagined, the first time you watch The Wizard of Oz, if you're Dorothy, nobody would imagine just how crazy that unknown world would be, you know? Um, but you know it's gonna be unknown. She might have been a ref, you know, like a, a fugitive running from the law. She might have had to go back and, and do battle with, uh, with the nasty neighbor and the sheriff and whatever. We don't know what it, what it could have been, but in her story, she gets whisked off. That's the, that's the hero's journey. That's the, the uh, refusal of the call. And again, when we were in kindergarten, we, all, we didn't get stuck in the refusal of the call. Like, we all did it. it it's kind of like Shackleton's, uh, does anybody know about, you know, when Shackleton was, was organizing his crew to go explore Antarctica, and he basically <laughs> said, um, you know, the, the probability of success is very low, the probability of death is very high, We'd love you to join us, and you know that's kind of that's literally how it feels at the beginning of these projects. Most of the most of the time, when you hear about innovation, you hear it back. You know, you hear about it after someone's already been successful. Like you know, when Gary Clausen created BlackBerry Messenger, and now when he talks about it, you know, he sounds like he sounds like a superhero, right? It's like, oh my goodness, I had this brilliant idea. But when you are first launching, he had no idea what he was doing. He had no idea. He was scared out of his wits. Um, he, had, he, you know, it's like in, in the corporate version of Shackleton's ad is the probability of success is very low, the probability of failure and possibly wrecking your entire career is very high, we'd love you to launch this project. But once again, in kindergarten, we have the solution. You do it one tiny step, one tiny experiment at a time. You don't let it interfere with your assigned duties, you don't create risk, you can do anything you want. That's how you get over the refusal to call. Okay, so the question is, why bother? Like, you know, why would I take my, my, why would I give away my breakthrough ideas, right? Like, I want to launch a startup. I, I could create, Gary Clausen created billions of dollars for BlackBerry. Uh, Paul Buhart created Google AdSense. He created billions of dollars for Google. He didn't, you know, he may have had some stock options, but he didn't, he's not a, he didn't become a billionaire from that. <laughs> Uh, Peter Caputa at, at HubSpot created the HubSpot Partner Program, 40% of revenue today. Uh, he didn't become a billionaire at HubSpot because of that, right? Um, and the reason that you, you do these is because you get to do something you love. No matter what type of job you have, you get to do something you love. And I think the best example of that is when I was in the Marine Corps. As I said, I was not a fan of the Marine Corps. I was counting the days. When I launched this side project, at the beginning, like you're just scared. Like you have no idea what you're doing. You're hoping you don't fail and get into trouble and make a fool of yourself. But as you go along, you start to gain confidence. You start to, like, even if your manager finds out, like Gary Clausen got a bad performance review by his manager, but it happened after he had already, he, he, was, having, he, he was having some success. He had attracted a couple of team members. At that point, you can't kill a side project. Nobody can kill a side project except for the person leading it, right? Um, 
And so it lets you do something you love. It's, um, it's, it also creates these opportunities for, for important things. And if you want to launch a startup, um, even then, I think these side projects are the way to go. So one of the things a lot of people don't understand uh, is that if you're in technology, if you're a developer, if you do anything creative and you, and, and you have a, an IP agreement with your company, it doesn't matter if you do a side project at home on your own computer, on your own time. Like by default, the company owns everything that you create at any time, no matter where you do it, when you do it. By default, the company owns all of that, right? So it really doesn't matter if you do it at work or at home, so do it at work, right? Um, the other thing is that when you launch a side project at work, you, um, you have access to an incredible amount of rich, interesting, challenging problems. I mean, that's really good. You go off and launch a startup, like you're, you're, you're out in the woods by yourself usually, you know? Uh, so that, that's, that's really good. You've got access to a lot of people. Um, you've got people that are at work and they're bored, just as bored as you are half the time, and so they'd love to join your startup, right? Um, they'd love to join your, your effort. Uh, if you do it as a startup, or if you do it you know, kind of on the side, and you're trying to attract other people, like the very first conversation is, okay, well, how much equity do I? Like, you already have to start talking about equity splits and who owns IP, and if they're an employee, their, their employer owns the IP just like yours does. You know, I actually did this um, when I was in Silicon Valley. I was an engineer. I launched a side project at home, thinking that this is mine. Then I found out it wasn't, even in California. Like, this is, we're, we're in Massachusetts, where it's worse. Even in California, like, um, so then I found, okay, I can get a waiver, that's cool. So I tried to get a waiver. That was a big pain in the butt. I mean, like, big pain in the butt. And at the end, they got a, uh, a, a perpetual unlimited license to use all that technology. So if they wanted to take that idea and do something, about it, like, they owned it anyway, right? Um, and, and, and so, and the other problem is that a waiver is for a specific idea. And when you launch a project, when you launch an adventure into the unknown, you don't know what you're gonna do. 80% of what you think is gonna work is, gonna, is not gonna work. And the only way you're gonna find out is by actually doing it. You can't find the 20% without doing it, no matter how much planning and everything else you do. You've gotta do it. So this is why we pivot, now you pivot, now the waiver doesn't apply anymore. So, you know, I like to equate it to a fish tank. You go to the Boston Aquarium, when you're in an, in, uh, in an established organization, you're in this nice, rich environment, you've got easy access to all kinds of things that are really valuable to you, right? Time, resources, all kinds of stuff. Um, when you launch a startup, you're outside on the glass and you're trying to knock, you know, and, and get somebody's attention, it's really hard. So, um, if you wanna launch a startup and you've got the means, just quit your job. The risk, of course, is that 80% of what you think is gonna, is gonna work is not gonna work, it's, it's very risky. Um, what's cool about side projects is that it's your project, it's your achievement. You are, if you succeed with a side project, you are now VC fundable. P Peter Caputa at, at HubSpot, he didn't become a billionaire at HubSpot, but he is now the CEO of, of Databox, a VC funded startup. He wouldn't have got that job if he didn't launch a side project, right? Um, the, uh, Paul Buhart also became VC fundable. He didn't become a billionaire from Google AdSense, but he did launch a site, uh, he did launch a, his own startup afterwards because he was VC fundable. He sold that to Facebook and now he's a partner at Y Combinator. That would not have happened if it, was, if, this, if it was like this. Most of the time you launch a side project at home, you're gonna, you're gonna burn yourself out. Uh, it, you're just not gonna be able to attract talent. Uh, you're, you've gotta go out and find resources and, and money elsewhere. So it's really hard. Get, get a, you know, get, rack up your achievements right inside your job, and then you can do anything you want. So that's the talk, that's the idea. And the, the real takeaways is that the side project let you do whatever it is you wanna do, side project let you do that. Um, do something you love, create your own job. Uh, and the other thing is that anyone can do this. You don't have to be a politically savvy <coughs> operator within your organization to, to be able to sell yourself. You don't have to be this master planner that can do these things. Uh, you, you can be the most introverted, um, shy, trembling, fearful person in the world and you can launch a side project and, and become a fabulous success in a way that you can never do if you have to go ask permission and, get, uh, and do it that way. So the call to action is if you're an employee, Launch a side project, do what you did in kindergarten. We can all do that, it's easy, it's fun, it will change your life. 
And if you're a manager, understand that um, these side projects uh, support the side projects, but do it in an offhanded way. Basically, it's like, it's cool that people are doing this, but I don't want to know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't want you to ask permission, because if you do, I'm probably going to have to say no, and I don't want to do that, right? So, that's just a very mixed signal. Right? What's that? That's yeah. a very mixed signal. That's the white space. What you're saying <laughs> is that, uh, you know, eventually, as you gain traction, as your project becomes successful, the, the established processes in the organization will start to take over. What's that? You get fired. You get fired? No. I've never seen a single person ever get fired for launching a side project in this way. Including Garen Clausen, who, like I said, he got a bad performance review. But at the end of the day, it, when, when, when things well, history started, is written by the winners, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if, if, you, if you ever find uh, someone who, 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 be, who, who was fired for, for doing one of these side projects where you don't create risk, you don't let it interfere with your assigned duties, uh, it'd be interesting to hear, but I've never heard of it. And I don't think, I don't think it happens very often. I'm not going to say it never happens, mm -hmm. but um, most of the time you don't get into trouble. Most of the time you don't get bad performance reviews because most of the time it's like, that's pretty cool that you're being innovative. Most of the time, the manager doesn't even find out what you're working on until after you already can talk about it, after you have some traction, after you have some success. And it's like, well, this is kind of cool. You know, we can't, we may not be able to throw some resources at it yet, but keep doing what you're doing. So, so that's the idea. Um, and I think, you know, the Boston DevOps community is amazing. Uh, we are, uh, uh, there's a large part of engineers, there's a lot part of uh, technical people, so we are more wired this way than say lawyers would be probably. Um, and so we've got an incredible community of people who are already doing this stuff. Um, I'm part of that community. I, I'm launching Herocracy, but we're not selling to employees. But if you're an employee and want to, um, and, and want to launch a side project and, and want some help to get over the refusal to call or whatever, you know, I love to help people who want to do big things and change the world. Uh, I, I think, you know, the reason I'm launching Herocracy is because I think side projects can, can change the world of work. It solves some really hard problems that we've been trying to solve for 100 years. Like, how do you get employees to be innovative? How do you get people energized? How do you get out, you know, how do you get, how do you have a proven business model, but still be innovative when innovation teams don't work, right? Like, um, it solves those problems in a very elegant way. And um, it, it turns out that changing the world is hard. And so if this is a topic that's interesting to you at all and would like to, to help out, I'd love to chat. Thank you. Oh, I turned it off. How did you? Oh, okay. Is it on again? Okay, fantastic. Thanks again, Jim. We are going to. Oh, announce raffle winner. Sorry, I almost glossed over that part. Who's announcing the raffle winner? Okay, it's coming. You are. I am. Oh, God. No, I'm just kidding. But now I'm out of hands, so this is going to get complicated. There we go. Does anyone else want to enter? Because this is your last ass out of chance. Space! Why, 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 why? I it's mixing like Do you want to draw it? Or do you want to read it? I'll read it. Oh, 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 oh. Mix it up! Remix, say, 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 say. Is this the remix? I think that's how that goes. I don't know. I'm scared. I'll take it. Anastasis. Ha oh, hey. ha! Oh, hey. Your title's just DevOps guy. <laughs> Yay, raffles. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Get food, get drink, talk to each other. Nice work, man. Cool. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that you're the one that had the answer to all the night. That was all of you. Good. Good choice. Yeah, yeah. Make something great. Yeah, me yeah. too. Well, so, we'll there's another speaker and then yeah, there's another Oh, I see that job. Yeah, like literally after So, give me a few minutes. I'm not talking to you. I know. I didn't make it. I'm just saying. I'm just
Boy, folks can turn their eyes toward the front-ish, wherever I am in this room. Uh, I just want to say quickly, Elena, I'm going to let you take it away, but Elena is with G2 Tech Group, going to be talking about how to measure worker happiness, so thank you again. Yay! Thank you! I'm Chief of Staff at G2. I've been with the company for two and a half years and I'm part of the leadership team here. So my presentation tonight is Transformational Leadership and Your DevOps Team, Tips and Tools to Help You Lead a Team of High Performers. So when I was going about writing my presentation about engineer happiness and burnout that you thought you signed up to come see, oh, minor title change, it occurred to me that there was a bigger picture theme at play than just identifying burnout. My research, the re researching my presentation brought me to the 2017 State of DevOps report presented by Puppet and Dora. Most of you are probably familiar with this report. I know Dave sends it out to the meetup group. But if you're new to the community, first of all, welcome. A brief overview of the report is that it comes out every year. This year, the 2017 report includes data from the past six years with over 27,000 survey responses from DevOps organizations. The goal of the report is to look at the statistical relationship between IT performance, organizational performance, tech practices, cultural norms, and management. So for the first time this year, the State of DevOps report looked at leadership types and how they impact performance, and those findings are what I'm going to focus on tonight. So first of all, why DevOps? I think everyone in the room is here because we believe in DevOps, and I don't need to convince you of its power. But here are some interesting statistics from the report. High-performing organizations that effectively utilize DevOps principles achieve 46 times more frequent software deployments than their competitors, 96 times faster recovery from failures, and 440 times faster lead time for changes, higher and also higher levels of customer satisfaction and operational efficiency. Data from this year's report also found that DevOps high performers deliver results. They're twice as likely as low performers to achieve their reported goals across both financial and non-financial measures. They also deliver a better experience. So there were five key findings from the State of DevOps report that are listed above. I'm not gonna attempt to read them all, but the first one, transformational leaders share five common characteristics that significantly shape an organization's culture and practices leading to high performance. This is what we will be diving into. So what is transformational leadership? Transformational leadership is a model in which leaders inspire and motivate followers to achieve higher performance by appealing to their values and sense of purpose, facilitating wide-scale organizational change. A good leader affects the team's ability to deliver code, architect good systems, and apply lean principles to how the team manages its work and develops products. Consider this, Gartner predicts by 2020, half of CIOs who have not transformed their team's capabilities will be displaced from their organization's leadership teams, aka out the door. So the writing's on the wall. If tech leaders don't embrace these ways of leading, they will be left in the dust. So why is transfer, transformational leadership so important, besides losing your job if you don't adapt to it? <laughs> well, in order to, <laughs> yeah, you best. Well, in order to be considered a high-performing organization, you should do the following. Establish high-trust cultural norms, enable developer productivity, support team experimentation and innovation, and achieve strategic alignment across your organization. The five characteristics of transformational leadership. <laughs> I have no idea where that goes. <laughs> it's, it's from the puppet report, actually. <laughs> the five characteristics. Number one, vision inspirational communication, intellectual stimulation, supportive leadership, and personal recognition. Here is what transformational leadership looks like. I'm gonna expand on each of the five characteristics and let you know what tools we use here at G2 to lead the team. A little sneak peek into G2 life. Are you ready? <laughs> the first character characteristic is vision. Transformational leaders have a clear concept of where the organization is going and where it should be in five years. They understand organizational direction and team direction. Having a vision gives us a sense of purpose. It guides our teams to work in the present toward a long-term goal. Leaders, specifically visionary leaders who can clearly articulate their vision, inspire others to join them on the journey. 
It does you no good if you have a visionary leader that keeps, all, keeps it all up in their head. The vision needs to be distributed and adopted by the entire organization in order to make it a reality. So how do we achieve this? At G2, we follow the EOS, EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating System, which is a leadership system for small businesses. EOS focuses on three areas. Number one is vision, which we've covered. Tra traction is the second one, which means instilling focus, discipline, and accountability throughout the company so everyone is executing on the vision every day. And lastly, building a healthy, cohesive, and functional leadership team. So here's a quote uh, from Gio Whitman who wrote the book Traction, which is what, it has a bunch of tools and it's what we follow as a leadership team. So what he said was, vision without traction is merely hallucination. You have to wrangle it in. So you don't need to completely overhaul your business and follow this whole, whole leadership system, but let me know if you're interested, happy to give advice. An easy thing that you could do right now to share your company vision is to create a physical version of your five-year plan and distribute it to your team. One of the most important tools in the Traction Book is the Vision Traction Organizer, or BTO, which is a physical tool to harness the team's focus on our vision. I left it in my office, so I'm going to pretend this is the BTO. <laughs> it's a laminated copy of our vision. So yeah, so fancy, fancy laminated. So at a high level, the VTO breaks the vision down into an organized fashion. It's also a written tool that can be circulated out to everyone. Typically, most visionaries aren't at all organized. We are, have no experience with that. So this helps keep everyone focused day to day. Our VTOs are updated twice a year at our leadership offsites and then distributed company-wide. Some engineers like to use it as a placemat at their desks, but hey, if they're looking at it, it's fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> Innovative. <laughs> so characteristic number two is inspirational communication. Transformational lead leaders communicate in a way that inspires and motivates in an uncertain or changing environment. No one's familiar with those environments, are they? At G2, we lead based on our core values. We also hire and fire based on the core values as well. When making a decision around people and actions, we always refer to the BTO to see if it aligns with the vision plan and core values. So our core values quickly are create wow experiences, solve problems, own the outcome, build cool stuff, and enjoy the ride. So one of the things that I kind of noticed as I was doing this was that trying to align what we do to what the report says was that we kind of are doing everything in a way and like how can we explain everything that we're doing. So that's sort of what I'm doing. Anyhow. Enjoy the ride is the last core value. So I went to my first Slayer concert last night. Um, <laughs> certainly enjoying the ride. Some of us are having trouble re-enjoying the ride tonight, having drinks. But yeah, it was. It was I, I can still hear it. It was fun. We had a good time. So here we are on our daily huddle via Zoom. This has become a staple of our culture at G2. Every morning we have departmental check-ins and it's a great way to get everyone motivated and pumped up, pumped up to execute on the vision. It also helps us balance a hybrid remote workforce. We love our Zoom. And I have to admit to you that all that this is a reenactment photo, so I forgot to take a picture of the huddle, so I had everybody, Chandler accidentally signed in because I slacked it out to everyone. He's in Philadelphia in the bottom right. Yeah, so it was, I like, I ran around to everyone and I was like, can you please get on the Zoom link because I need a picture for my presentation. <laughs> so anyways, it really does look like this though, but you can tell I'm like, Ch uh, poor Chandler, he was working, or he probably wasn't, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> he had to get on the Zoom because I slapped him. <laughs> so characteristic number three, intellectual stimulation. Transformational leaders challenge followers to think about problems in new ways. They challenge their team's status quo, they challenge their teams to constantly ask new questions, and challenge their teams on basic assumptions about the work. So back to the morning huddles. Part of the daily conversation is identifying areas for improvement. We ask each other questions like, what are you working on today? And how can we get this done smarter or faster? If one engineer, think Brent from the Phoenix Project, has too many tickets assigned to them and is being a bottleneck, then we can ask the group, does Brent need to be the one to do them all? Is there someone else that can step in and get the job done? So every other Thursday, we have a service delivery team retrospective meeting, aka therapy session. That includes a review of the past week's on-call reactive support incident, incidents. 
page of duty alerts, etc. And then we do a retrospective review of what worked and didn't work this week in service delivery. We then list out the following columns on the whiteboard. You can see Reed and his muscles demonstrating that in the picture up there. Which way to the beach? <laughs> One day his sleeves popped right off his shirt at the <laughs> So we have the columns. The first one is start, something we should start doing. The second one is stop, something that we should stop doing. It's really not working. The next one is good, good things that happened this week, then bad, bad things that happened this week, and then we have the best one for last, which is fails. What did we fail at or fail to accomplish this week? Some uglies. <laughs> So we go around the room and everyone adds an item to each column, and the fun part comes at the end. We get the whole company in the room, we vote on who has the worst fail, and whoever gets the most vote for their fail is past the chicken. They must sign the chicken, and then they become the keeper of the chicken until the next meeting vote. So what is the chicken, you ask? I hear you asking that. It's a disgusting can. Yeah. <laughs> It's never been open, that's from the internet. Is that a real, uh, I was gonna say, is that a real chicken falling on that can? That is real, and that's I love it. It's in my office, yeah. it's supposed to be up here. That's so anyways, that's but that's all the... <laughs> I'm out of here, dude. That's, that's, that's it's really foul. Oh no. Oh no. So, uh, anyways. Is that legit? So, yeah. well, it's never come out of the can. I got that picture off the internet. Oh Abolish the chicken! All right, time out for the chicken. Cause you gotta hear when you shake the can, the noise oh, it makes. No. no way, that's for real. No, no it's, it's real. It's a deep bone chicken in a can. Oh. <laughs> that is not oh, extremely delicious. I don't know what does. <laughs> so there's a little sign on the oh, oh, God. <laughs> so you can see you have to sign it, the date, the offense, the offense. I'll get to that part. It's really disgusting, but anyways, all jokes aside, it's designed to be a fun team building exercise, the, the point being that it's okay to fail. Shit. Kind of, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. We're like, really gross. Yeah, that's, really. Jeez, that's chicken. Chicken. Yeah, that's for greater offenses. <laughs> So the passing of the chicken has become somewhat of a ritual. This is Tom passing the chicken to Caleb last week in full dad mode. And for those of you who don't know, Caleb's our vice president of operations. He's kind of a big deal. And I've actually never seen him make a mistake. However, <laughs> he had a new MacBook. I don't even know if MacBook's the right term. I feel like I'm probably saying something stupid. But anyways, delivered to the wrong address, which was like one block over and a little switching of the numbers. Anyways. He owned the outcome of this make mistake and graciously accepted the chicken. I'm, I'm sneaking in the core value, if, you, if you're catching on. So yeah, the chicken. All right, characteristic number four, we're almost there, is supportive leadership. Supportive leaders demonstrate care and consideration of followers, personal needs and feelings. Super huggy, feely, touchy, love it. One thing we do at G2 to lead and better work together is require everyone to take a disc assessment. Essentially, a DISC assessment is a survey questionnaire that measures how a person responds to challenges, how they influence others, how they respond to rules and procedures, and what their preferred pace of activity is. Basically, what's your working style? How are you? What's going to make you mad? What's not? What's going to get you to do things? Anyways, the survey results place you in, a circle, in the circle above using the four reference points that, make, that the letters DISC, D-I-S-C stand for. So the D stands for dominance, the I stands for influence, the S stands for steadiness, and the C stands for conscientiousness. So between transformational and conscientiousness, you have to like, I'm doing well, right? The words are hard to say. <laughs> so here we have Glenn's disc profile. I feel like I'm getting trolled. <laughs> <laughs> where, where does Glenn rank on the disc assessment? It's right there. So okay. like, he has an extremely high D profile. It's actually, Possibly, it's almost all the way. So you can see the D at the top. Dangerous. That's the first one. Dangerous. There's so that no measures. So it's D is there. It's, yeah, D is, well, D is for dangerous. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it shows. So the D I S E is how much D, how much I. So it's D I. His S is really low. Scary. And then the C is a little bit just as low. So anyways. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He doesn't. One of the things is that he doesn't like to be set aside. I'm like, okay. What does it mean? So you can use care. your own letter oh, style. What does it mean, right? <laughs> what does it mean? I am still trying to figure it out. Anyways, so you can use the letter styles to communicate based on the below. So 
If you're communicating with a D style like Len, he wants to know the what. If you're communicating with an I style, they want to know who. Eyes really care about if people like them or not. An S style wants to know how. How are we going to do it? Steadiness. And C wants to know the why. So if I need Glenn to answer a question or if I want to throw an idea by him, first I must track him down. That is the hard part. Nothing to do with the disk assessment. Very hard to find. And then in order to get an answer, I need to ask him very specifically what it is I want to know or do. He doesn't want the details of who is involved or how I'm going to do it, which I always try to get them. And adding these details will actually make it more difficult for me to get his buy-in or, an or an answer, which is usually the case. So one of the most valuable things the DISC results provide is a window into how to lead, motivate, aka work well with someone. You can use each person's profile to tailor your approach to generate the best results. Engineers, profiles are typically S and C. In order to get buy-in from an engineer with an S or C profile, it is important to explain the how and why. When communi communicating with them, don't rush them and use facts and logic to explain your point. Tips I've learned about everyone here through the DISC assessments, we've done a lot of um, company activities around them. We really try to, to, to work with them. So anyways, S and C engineers do not like when you walk up to them and give them hugs. Do not do this. I'm sure that is not from a surprise. <laughs> anyway. I got slapped once. So yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. You're not going to make friends that way. So anyways, um, the other thing that I learned is that Caleb doesn't like loud noises. Who knew? <laughs> what? And Glenn never makes loud noises, so it's perfect. You know, Slayer, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> so we made it to the fifth and final characteristic, personal recognition. Transformational leaders praise and acknowledge achievement of goals and improvements in work quality, and they personally compliment others on outstanding work. The State of the DevOps report found that transformational leadership is highly correlated with employee net promoter score, which NPS is the street term. They found transformational leaders in places where employees are happy, loyal, and engaged. Not that I'm comparing anyone to a dog. I want to know why watermelon on a dog's head is I just like really like dogs and thought it was cute, but. It was cute. It was. So at G2, we use a tool called Tiny Pulse to gauge employee satisfaction and happiness. Tiny Pulse is a performance management tool that helps leaders improve employees' performance and achieve company goals. There are a number of similar tools to Tiny Pulse, but we've hitched ourselves to this wagon for now, paying for the bills, you know. So I'll give you some more detail on how we use it. So how it works. Every week a survey is emailed and slacked out, which is key to everyone. It consists of one question that's fast to answer, and all of the responses are anonymous. So here's an example of a question, which is really tiny, so you probably can't see it, so we'll read it. And the question was, do you think that we consistently stay true to our core values as an organization? So you answer, you click the button, yes or no, and you can see the responses above. Um, you can see, so this is just like one screen, but there's a lot of ways to manipulate the data, and you can segment it by department and things like that. Super interesting. However, so the results of this particular survey, 92% um, of people at G2 think we are staying true to our core values, which is awesome. The industry benchmark uh, was 77%, and the overall benchmark is 79%, so we're crushing that, which is cool. 81% um, of employees answered this particular question. One person left a suggestion, so you can leave an anonymous suggestion at any, at, on any survey. You can say anything, and no one knows it's coming from you. So, and 11 cheers for peers were input, and I will explain that in the next, next and last slide. So one more tid tidbit about Tiny Polls. Every three weeks, the survey asks the same question, how happy are you at work? Which kind of seems repetitive, but there's a reason for it. It's designed to keep a pulse on employee happiness and give us the ability to proactively address any issues or patterns. There are a lot of other cool features, but I figure this gives you a general idea of how, how it works. So this is the last and final slide. It's the Cheers for Peers, ending on a nice positive note. So here's some examples of Cheers for Peers within Tiny Pulse. It's an excellent vehicle to acknowledge and motivate the team. It feels so good when someone sends you a Cheers. It's the best thing ever. So you can send the Cheers anonymously, or you can let the sender know who it's from. And they're automatically pushed out through Slack, so you don't have to like log in to your account to see if you got it. Like You are sitting, whatever. as soon as it's sent, you get it. Everyone gets it. The whole company sees it. So there are, so yeah, so that's it. And this is the last slide, it's a sweet slide, so. So thanks.
Um, <laughs> quick drink or snacks, and we're gonna do Q and A uh, with Jim. So thank Yay. you. My disc, um, so this is a really funny story. So my last job I was at a finance, so most of you, a lot of you know me, but anyways, I came into the company as an assistant and the operations coordinator, and I came from a finance company, and I had a really like rigid disc. And we've, I've taken it two or three times since, and it's like, this is like really creepy, it's slowly like morphing into like a mini Glenn disc, like I'm nowhere near this <laughs> Obviously like, it's like, you know, not, not anywhere near there. I will never know. <laughs> But yeah, so it, 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 the way that I interpret it is that I got out, I wasn't supposed to be in the finance environment, I wasn't supposed to be at like a super corporate job, and then once I was like out of it, like I, my personality was able to come out. And, and, and it is, it's your working style, so my working style was very conservative, and then slowly, super conservative here as you can see. <laughs> it's all I will say. Awesome. Do you have to play my chicken? Uh, yeah, I have to play my chicken. Yeah. Cool. Why wasn't I in this? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I have to know that that was legit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Do you want to sit? Do you want to stand? How do you want to do it? Yeah, you have to have seats. That's what I'm saying. You, wow, that's cool. This isn't a lineup. Yeah. You guys can sit down. Yeah, you do what you want. I don't think I'm going to do this. Okay. I don't think I'm going to do this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I would say just uh, shout it out. Anybody who has a question or, or anything like that, you can raise your hand. Do you, you, you want to run the mic? Oh, yeah, sure. oh okay. Uh, Apparently I'm running a mic. Oh, oh shit. Well, yeah, just run one mic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a simple question and a complicated question. The simple question is if only 81% of the company responded, how do you know that 92% of the company had a particular response? 90. <laughs> Math. <laughs> so 92% of the 81 people uh, that responded, responded yes. Uh, yeah, you can see. <laughs> so when you scroll over the pie chart, it says like one person, it will like go up. So three person responded no, but it was like, I think it was probably one person that responded. Right, so it wasn't 92%. One person and we will find them. There's the evil child. So that's, um, oh, hello. Excellent presentation. Thank it's, you. It's nice to see those type of statistics and keeping the pulse of um, of company. The question that's sent out every third time about, you know, are you happy? Now, if you start to see a trend and it's anonymous, is that something that you that is just it's just transparent across the board, or how would you go about? Um, kind of dealing with that. So the way that it works I'm is sure that, that never happens though, G2. Yeah, well, obviously not. Right, but of course yeah, not. No, so it totally does. Um, so it varies all the time, and you know, you'll think things are going great, and then you see like maybe they're not, and then they are go and they're not going great, and people are happy. It's like, what's going on? But the way that it is designed is that you, you answer the survey, so you're ranking one to 10, or you're saying yes or no, and then you leave a suggestion. And so sometimes, or like you explain your answer, right? You don't have to, so you don't have to do that. But <laughs> oftentimes you can kind of get a feel and then you can, if you do leave a suggestion, and even if you don't leave a suggestion, you can reach out to that responder and say like, hey, is there something that we could do or a conversation you want to have? And you know, we are a small company, so it is hard right. because you, you know, if you want to be anonymous, you, it's, it's very easy to like, not be right so then so then there's that but yeah so it's set up so that there's good good communication the bigger the company gets the easier it is but it's it's cool yeah I've got a question for Jim um, a friend of mine had this thing happen to him where um, talking about his side project uh, to a potential future employer and um, uh, the, the, the circumstances were that the team was working on something and this person was working on an alternative. And uh, it so happened that the alternative was not picked as a sort of a winner of this little competition. 
um, unofficial competition, by the way. Uh, and um, this example, it would seem, was perceived that this person was not a team player and rather very individualistic and is not like, you know, there's a lot of, like, I'm not sure what the right term is. I think I've heard somebody say the word brain fuckery happening here. Where, <clears throat> like, you can't win if somebody is evaluating you on something that you don't, you know, expect them to evaluate you on. Like, that there's some very strange stuff happening that they're looking for, which, which I feel like is a, like a confirmation where it's like, ah, I found this, right? So, anyway, in that, in that perspective, uh, uh, from, from, uh, from that perspective, from that friend's experience, what, what would you say um, to encourage that person to continue working on a side project and not be discouraged by certain, you know, unfortunate circumstances? It, it's a great question. Was the, 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 uh, the project that was selected, was it kind of an officially sponsored project and he was doing something or were they both kind of unofficial Projects and one just kind of won the survival of the fittest kind of thing. Well, from what I understand, from what I understand it was uh, actually during an official hackathon. But the idea of a hackathon that you yourself come up with something to work on, mm. and this was one of those things where like, hey guys, work on this thing, uh, and this person was like, oh hey, this thing does something similar. Let me work on this alternative version of it that yeah. we've been talking about, by the way, for some time. Right. So like, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Like, sort of official, but not really official. Yeah, that that's actually one of the kind of ways to ruin a, a hackathon or any kind of innovation thing is where you kind of tell people what to work on because then <laughs> you've got the people in power who are again making the decisions. That, that's slightly different issue. What I'm what I'm interested in is the, this weird perception of of you working on the side project, especially in secret. Does it make you sort of a jackass? Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so it really depends. I, I guess what I'm saying is that it depends on the organization, it depends on the culture, and unfortunately, you can't es escape culture. I mean, we're all we're, we're all affected by it. Uh, he he isn't a jackass. He should be doing what what, what exactly what he's doing. Know. And and I think uh, when my my experience in Silicon Valley startups is that the the really high performing teams are the one where you've got these uh, separate projects potentially running in parallel, attacking the same problem, and it really is kind of competing to see which one uh, will win. It doesn't matter if one is, is from the founder and another one is from the lowest person, and I've done this myself, and that can be really successful if you've got an executive team who kind of values the idea that they are not the one who has a monopoly on the good ideas. Unfortunately, there are a lot of organizations and a lot of executives who have a belief that they are the brilliant minds and everybody else, really the big challenge they face is how do I get these people to just do what I want them to do? Yeah! And, and <laughs> <laughs> so in those organizations, uh, life can be rough. And this is where you know, the people who launch these projects and establish organizations, naturally people like me, uh, uh, people like Jerwat, I have a word for them that we, we call them mavericks. You know, they're, they have a higher tolerance for risk, and so um, they will do it anyway. Unfortunately, most people aren't kind of able to cross that, and so it becomes challenging, and these are real issues. Can I punctuate that? I, sorry, yes. I know yes. I'm stealing the mic. I'm the yes. runner. I'm <laughs> um, so I just wanted to sort of ask a follow-up though around well that's one style of um, like developer or that's one particular culture that a company might be trying to cultivate but I think about a company maybe more like Pivotal or Pivotal Labs or Intrepid or ones where people are pairing constantly or it's really encouraging a very close collaborative style where there's a lot of mobbing there's a lot of pairing how does uh, having a side project or being a maverick fit into that paradigm yeah, so the idea is that the more you try to manage innovation, the more you will kill it always. And so if you if you put in a requirement that you can't launch a project unless you can at least find one other person to join you, you've already eliminated most of the big breakthrough ideas because uh, as I said, the big ones are the ones where you can't, e you don't even have the language to explain what you're trying to do. Like every single person thinks you're 
crazy because they're stuck in the existing paradigm. And so I would say that um, a lot of companies are trying to get people to be more innovative. There's lots of really cool ideas. But if you really want to understand how true innovation happens, if you really look at where the big breakthroughs happen, uh, they almost always start on this very lonely journey of, of, of somebody uh, taking some crazy idea, a hunch, uh, a gut feeling, and moving it forward. And then later, people kind of uh, join. But at the very beginning, it's a lonely, scary place to be. <laughs> not on. Okay. So I think that's a really Ill interesting assertion that I'm not sure that I agree with. Um, I think that that could be the result of a lot more than just what you're talking about. And so to go back to the question, I I'm really curious though about um, that's one person's strength, right? Some people are really good at working individually, being that cowboy, lone coder. I'm talking about what if that's not your style? How do you work on a side project? Yeah, so you can always uh, try to get uh, people to, to, to join your project and, and pitch your idea and, and get people to join you. And, um, and, and, and if that's the only way that you can actually do it, then if you really can't work alone, if you can't work with some type of validation, uh, I think that that is reasonable. But just understand that you are then, you know, um, Taking, taking some of the best um, opportunities, the ones that you feel in your gut that you can't explain to other people, um, you're kind of eliminating that from the race, and I think that's a mistake. All right, I, I wanna do a follow-up on that. Just so, um, not to speak to uh, spoiler Lord, but one of the things um, when you talk about the, uh, the lonely journey or the hero's walk, um, and you and I have talked you know, um, in detail, right? And I really believe in a lot of what you're saying, but I do want to highlight some of the personality traits of individuals like yourself and, and, and me who are able to take that journey and know that it's because of our passion and our desire that we will walk alone. Um, what resources are available right now for folks who do not have that like A type personality or if we look at the disassessment, high D, high I, for them to be successful, because the, the the bigger, I guess, objective and goal that we we want people to walk away with is that no matter what type of personality, what type of background you have, um, we are all in the game together. Is there any kind of resources other than, you know, um, we're gonna have your contact information so people will be able to reach out to you directly. Um, what have you found out there that's available for folks who, who need to kind of bounce ideas off of somebody else in order to be able to launch something like this. Is there anything like that out there? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question, and in my experience there's not a lot, which is why I'm really uh, launching Herocracies, because I believe that it should not just be these, the, it should not just be people like, like uh, that are able to take those first steps on their own that do this. That there's so many, uh, there's so much talent, potential, um, there, there's so many different personalities, and and it's, a, it's an innate part of human nature. We're all innately uh, creative. We're, we're all, um, like I said, we all do, knew how to do this stuff in kindergarten. And so um, the, 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 the good thing is, is that when you look at like HubSpot, when, when Peter Caputa launched his lonely journey to create what became HubSpot Partner Program at HubSpot, even HubSpot at that time there was like just one or two, three people in the entire company of 300 people who was allowed to decide what projects to work on. And within those projects, there's all kind of innovative, you know, energy and opportunity and whatnot. But to actually decide what type of project to launch, it was in the hands of very few people. Peter Caputa came along, he did what other people could not do, and he became successful. The executives were kind of enlightened and said, well, we should do more of this. And what happened is that Peter Caputa himself, as a maverick, became a support for other people who had different personalities. Who, you know, the hero's journey, the way you get across that uh, the refusal to call is by actually um, having a, a, a support from somebody who's kind of been down that road before and can, and can say, you know what, I believe in you. I, 
I don't, I don't know if your idea is going to work, but I, I know that you can do something. And if, if, if there's something there, you will figure it out. And, and so that's kind of the, the resource. I think the, the tech community is nice because there's a lot more people like that. So there are, like, there is some support naturally for it. But the reason I'm trying to, uh, the reason I want to launch Herocracy is because, you know, I don't want to just get the Mavericks to do this. I don't even want to just get the early adopters. I want to get the 34% of early majority who are not, never going to do this until they see the early adopters not only doing it, but being successful with it. You get them on board, then you get the later duck. Now you've got 84% of, of people who are now able to do this when they couldn't do it before. But you've got to walk them along that, uh, that, that law diffusion of innovations curve. You know, the laggards are not going to do it unless there's a crisis. If the company is failing, the company is on fire, and they're about to lose their job in six months, unless they are innovative, believe me, they will be innovative. We all have it inside of us. Um, but that's kind of, you've got to walk people across that path. Peter Caputa did it at HubSpot. He got, within two years, he had more than 11% of the company had side projects exactly like he had, working on their own thing. Those are not all Mavericks doing that. Um, you know, the 3M actually started this way. Dick Drew was the Maverick. He created Scotch Tape. It may not sound like a big deal now. Back then, it was a complete breakthrough revolution. It changed the, the, the vision and the, the destiny of 3M forever. Um, they were a sandpaper company, now they, they did more than that. And he also did the same thing. He was an inspiration for other people, and so now you had you know, 10, 20% of, of, of 3M, without any management support, without any approvals or anything like that, having these projects. And that's how you actually start getting more people than just the people whose wiring is a little bit faulty. No, you don't have to be Superman. Sometimes you can be a member of the Power Rangers. <laughs> right? And there are some notable success stories. Two Steves who worked in a garage while one of them was working at Hewlett Packard and the other one was working for an advertising agency. And they invented a little company called Apple. Two people who were dropouts from Harvard, one of whom was really good at writing operating system code and the other one who's uncle was on the board of directors for IBM and they wrote a little thing called BASIC and they wrote a little thing called DOS and we know how they ended up. Um, and a company, uh, I don't know if anyone here knows the name, Ian Goddard, he's a s systems architect for hardware. He and literally nine other people continued working at Philips and other places for 10 years while they did a side project that became the most innovative new design for CPUs that's currently in existence. Um, so you don't have to be all by yourself. There are some things that work very well as an individual. There are other things where the complexity of the situation or your personality is not such that you're gonna, you know, but find a circle. Find a circle and work with them. Um, and I'd also say be careful about, don't do it on the job because then if your boss is got any mad on whatsoever, he's going to claim that you're hurting your performance and he's going to hold it against you. Don't work on company equipment if you want any chance whatsoever of being able to call it your own. And try not to do something that you're doing at work. Because that, they could legitimately say you're infringing on their intellectual property by working on something similar to what the company already does. That also fits in with your idea to do something as differently as possible. So you do those three things and you've got a better chance of owning it when it's over. All right, so unfortunately we gotta wrap it up. People can continue to have this discussion in small pods. Thank you both so much. Awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So Kosuke, he's the uh, founder of Jenkins.